New Orleans Saints wide receiver Michael Thomas just had a game in which he caught no passes for the first time in his career. But it ain't bothering him. We got all that and a little bit of land yet for you on today's episode of Locked on Saints. You are Locked on Saints, your daily New Orleans Saints podcast. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. What is good, Houdat Nation and Houdat family? Welcome in to another episode of Locked on Saints, your daily podcast covering your favorite team, the New Orleans Saints, part of Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Thank you, as always, for making Locked on Saints your first listen of the day every day. And a big shout out to all you everydayers out there. Don't forget, you can subscribe and follow for free on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts so you never miss the latest episodes. And if you want to keep the conversation going one-on-one with me, take part in our exclusive film studies, Q&As, and much more, you can become a Locked on Saints insider today by heading over to joinsubtext.com slash Locked on Saints to join a community I would love for you to be a part of. As always, I am your host, Ross Jackson, at Ross Jackson NOLA on your favorite social media, your New Orleans Saints expert, credential member of the Media Saints News Network, Tuesdays in the Locked on NFL podcast, and here with you every single Monday through Friday, and then some on Locked on Saints. And today's episode of Locked on Saints is brought to you by our friends at FanDuel. Make every moment more. Right now, new customers will get $150 in bonus bets simply by winning a $5 money line bet. That's $150 bucks in bonus bets. If your team wins, just visit FanDuel.com slash Locked on to get Started on today's episode of Locked on Saints. We're still looking at the Saints and Chicago Bears game. The Saints escaped with a seven point victory. I'm going to tell you why I'm not tripping over the point differential in this game, even with the turnover differential in mind. We're going to take a look at the offensive line who has performed better, but still has had some down moments that have cost the New Orleans Saints some big moments. But first, I want to take a look. At Michael Thomas's game again here against the Cleve, uh, the the Chicago Bears. The fact that Michael Thomas finished this game with one target, technically two, but one of which was called a non-play because of a defensive holding penalty. But the fact that he finished this game with one target and no catches is something that a lot of people I can still see are hanging on to and are concerned about. And I'm here to tell you that there's nothing to be concerned about when it comes to this game as a representative nature of the rest of Michael Thomas's season. He's second on this team in targets. The team very obviously still trusts him. There's an incentive heavy deal going on, which means that the Saints have historically shown that they try to get the most out of those incentive deals. And Michael Thomas would want the most out of that incentive heavy deal. And I'm trying to get you not to read too much into a zero catch game, which is the first of Michael Thomas's career, actually the first game in which he's had less than two catches in a game in which he was active during the regular season in which uh, he was active. So uh, there's two things, two sides of this that I want to look at. I want to look at the is Michael Thomas concerned part and the should you be concerned part. To start with the should you be concerned part, and the reason why I say that you shouldn't is because clearly this is not representative of how the Saints feel about him, how Derek Carr feels throwing to him, or how Michael Thomas feels getting open. Michael Thomas had a couple of plays to where he got open. On the Juwan Johnson catch over the middle of the field, Michael Thomas worked his way open. Two over routes that we're actually going to be talking about a little bit later, he was wide open. I'll tell you why the pass didn't make it to him. And then we've also got other options to where he was double teamed, particularly in the red zone, opening up opportunities for other players. This is a game that illustrates perfectly exactly what it is that we said at the very beginning of this season when Michael Thomas decided to come back. And we consistently got the question, oh, is Michael Thomas still the Michael Thomas of 2019? And what did we keep saying? He doesn't have to be. There's no reason to ask him to be. You've got Chris Olave, you've got Rashid Shaheed, you've got Juwan Johnson, Foster Moreau. Jimmy Graham had been signed, uh, you know, was eventually signed, but has been inactive over the course of these past two games. Uh, you've got Alvin Kamara who can catch out of the backfield, Jamal Williams, Kendra Miller who can catch out of the backfield. You don't need Michael Thomas to have 149 catches in a season. Those days are over, not because he can't produce to that level. That's not what we're saying. What we're saying is he doesn't have to. There's no need for him to be that guy. Instead, he can go out there, draw attention from other players, and create moments for his teammates. And we saw several examples of that 
throughout this game. Chris Olave's touchdown pass. Michael Thomas draws a double team, gets Chris Olave a one-on-one, one-on-one, he wins. Boom, touchdown on that end zone. The, uh, that pass to um, Juwan Johnson over the middle of the field. Michael Thomas attracts some additional attention from the safety, kind of stalls the safety from being able to crash down to where Juwan Johnson was going in a vacated area in the middle of the field. Boom, not only do the Saints see Derek Carr connect with Juwan Johnson, but you see them do the thing that people have been asking them to do, including myself, the entire season so far, which is attack the middle of the field. So why downgrade the thing that we've asked them to do by saying that you could have done this instead? So it doesn't make sense. Like there's no reason to be critical about this and there's no reason to be concerned about it. This is illustrating exactly what we knew about Michael Thomas's return from the very beginning, which is that he doesn't have to catch 149 passes. Instead, he goes out there and makes the plays when he's asked to make the plays and helps to create opportunities for other players in which they're asked to make plays. And what we saw against Chicago was him help to create moments for other players that they then capitalized on, at least for the majority of the game. The other piece is, is it bothering Michael Thomas? Very clearly, it's not. And you can see it evidenced by his post-game locker room speech. Take a listen to what he had to say. Continue to build. Let's stay on this road, man. Let's stay on this road and win it. That's all that matters at the end of the day, man. Come out here. Let's come out here, get better, find ways to improve, and focus on winning every week, week in and week out, man. Family on three. One, two, three. In a game in which Michael Thomas gets zero catches for the first time in his entire career on an active regular season game, he gives the breakdown post game after a win and talks about how winning is the only thing that matters. This doesn't do well for the Michael Thomas is a diva narrative pushers. This doesn't do well for the the New Orleans Saints have division in their locker room theorists. This doesn't do well for those categories. This shows you, yet again, the New Orleans Saints choose unity when everyone else is looking for displays of division. And this shows, once again, that Michael Thomas has chosen to be here and to do what it takes to help the team win games and therefore him win games. The individual accolades are nice, but a 2019 season where you set the individual record for most catches in a single season that comes up empty from the team perspective, a playoff appearance, and then knocked off before you get the opportunity to even make it to a championship game for your conference, somehow means a little bit less than going into a season and winning a Super Bowl when you don't set that record. I'm not saying the New Orleans Saints are on their way to a Super Bowl here, but that's got to be the goal for every NFL team outside of maybe the Cardinals and the Panthers. But that's got to be the goal for every NFL team coming into their season. That's the goal. You're trying to get to the playoffs. You're trying to win playoff games. You're trying to get to a Super Bowl. You're trying to win the Super Bowl. If you're not doing that, then don't get on the field. And Michael Thomas is more concerned about winning games and helping his team get into the playoffs for an opportunity at that Super Bowl appearance, that Super Bowl win, whatever. That's the goal, not the individual accolades. And a speech like that, a moment like that, the fact that he gave a speech on a game in which he had zero catches tells you everything that you should be paying attention to about Michael Thomas, as opposed to what they're trying to tell you about Michael Thomas. There's no reason to be concerned here that he had zero catches, and clearly, MT, not concerned at all. Coming up next, we're going to be taking a look at the New Orleans Saints offensive line. Overall, performed well, but came up short on some moments that could have led to some big catches for Michael Thomas and still struggling in the run game. Let's break it all down as we continue on with today's episode of Locked on Saints, part of Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Today's episode of Locked on Saints brought to you by our friends at Prize Picks, the easiest and most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. And guess what? It just got even more exciting. You can go through and do you know this the standard way that we always talk about: pick two to six players, choose whether or not they're going to come in at more or less than their Prize Picks projection, and with that, you can win up to twenty-five times your entry. Or this is really cool: you can now do specials leagues where you can combine. Combo pick projections across multiple sports. So for instance, you could choose a combo for, let's say, LeBron James and Michael Thomas, that the number of catches that Michael Thomas has and the number of three-pointers that LeBron James drains will be 
more or less than 10 and a half, for instance. And then you play that out and you can win. Like, isn't that cool? I think that that's awesome. Super, super fun stuff going over at Prize Picks. Always looking for ways to innovate and always looking for ways to give you the most fun experience with daily fantasy sports. Go and check them out today. Head over to prizepicks.com slash locked on NFL and enter promo code in all lowercase locked on NFL for a first deposit match up to $100. It's a first deposit match up to $100 at prizepicks.com slash locked on NFL. Promo code all lowercase locked on NFL. Prize picks, your place for daily fantasy sports. All right, family, continuing on with today's episode of Locked on Saints. Appreciate you as always. Make it Locked on Saints your first listen of the day every day. Big shout out to the everydayers out there. I want to take a look at the offensive line now for the New Orleans Saints. The Saints uh, coming up big with a win that they needed against the Chicago Bears. And altogether, the offensive line performed well. Um, Derek Carr was under pressure on only 11 of his dropbacks. That's up from four last week. But we knew that this was going to be a more talented pass rush for the Chicago Bears than the not so great pass rush for the uh, Indianapolis Colts. Now, the Bears don't get a lot of sacks, but they get a lot of pressure. They get more pressure than, than, than the Colts do. And so when you look at the addition of Montez Sweat, who overall was kept quiet, three hurries in this game, not a huge factor, pair of tackles, no tackles for a loss, no hits on the quarterback, no sacks, nothing like that. So the offensive line like performed well over that case. Now, if you look at the Pro football focus numbers of, uh, of number of pressures allowed. You can see 13 total pressures allowed. Remember, some of those pressures happen on the same play. That's why you see only 11 dropbacks from, from Derek Carr in which he was under pressure. But there was a couple of those dropbacks that were costly, right, in which he was under pressure. Now, Derek Carr completed six of his 10 passes under pressure. Pretty good day from that. Like, let's just be real. But there's a couple of passes that he either didn't throw or had to go somewhere else or scrambled, whatever that might be. That could have been big plays, particularly to Michael Thomas. There's two such instances in which Michael Thomas is running this deep over route, something he's always been very, very good at. So he's crossing the field on a rounded cut into the middle of the field from right side to left side on both of these plays. And in both instances, as he moves into the middle of the field, there's no defenders around him. But as he's crossing into that area, Derek Carr is having to bail out of the pocket. He's having to get on, he's having to, to mosey. He's having to run and everything like that. And so because of that, you miss the timing. So this is still a consistent issue for the New Orleans Saints offensive line is that it's inability to keep Derek Carr's pocket clean. They're doing a good job keeping Derek Carr clean right now. But now what you're looking at is, can you keep the pocket clean? That inability to do that is costing them some big plays down the field. And one of these plays was on third down. Another one could have helped with keeping a drive alive, all these other things. So that's still what you want to see from this New Orleans Saints offensive line when it comes to improving. Have they improved? Absolutely. Is there still more improvement to be had? Absolutely. And that's what you want to be looking at at this point, right? You want to be looking at how do you get better off of a win a lot more than you want to be looking at how do you get better off of a loss? Because honestly, one, the list is shorter and two, the, the morale is a lot higher. So it's easier to be able to go in and say, hey, we won this game, but look, we missed this opportunity. Look, we missed this opportunity. Look, we missed this opportunity. And here's why. And that's what I want to look at. Why? Why are we seeing this for the New Orleans Saints? There's two main possibilities, not just two, but two main possibilities. The first of which is that it just, look, it's bad timing for when the pressure is given up, right? We're not talking about six man rushes here. We're talking about at most one blitzer, more than likely. We're, we're in, and in most cases, we're talking about a four man rush. So in some cases, you just lose the wrong rep at the worst time. And, and that's what happens. And sometimes that happens multiple times during a game. It's what we talk about all the time on this show. Football's about the moments. So can you stack those moments? These were missed opportunities to stack moments, but they didn't create moments at you know, for the Chicago Bears, right? They just weren't moments at all. So that's okay. Uh, the other thing is, is there something about where, and this, this happens, the Saints are on their, uh, went into this game with their sixth different offensive line combination through nine games. Is there something about the depth of Derek Carr's dropbacks and the sort of landmarks for where the offensive line are trying to block? When you're trying to block for a quarterback, you're doing it based upon the depth that you expect that they're getting off of a dropback. So, you know, a seven step or a five step dropback, you might be saying, OK, in this offensive system, it's a seven yard dropback in that case for a five step drop. So then that means that this tackle's landmark is this area, this tackle's landmark is this area, these two guards landmark here, and this center 
helps out here, there, or their landmark is there. And it's all based on keeping a nice, neat pocket around the quarterback and enough space for which that quarterback should have to be able to uh, kind of have throwing lanes, right? So what you might be seeing is a little bit of a disconnect between that. And this happens with quarterbacks in new systems and can be a season long kind of thing that takes a long time to fix. It's not something that gets fixed very, very quickly. You saw it big time for that Minnesota Vikings game uh, last week, just a couple of days ago against the Atlanta Falcons when Josh Dobbs had to go in. His drop back depth was not equal to what the pocket that the offensive line was trying to create. Is this something that the Saints are struggling with? Not necessarily just because Derek Carr is new to the system, but also because you've gone through six different, you had another brand new collection or a combination of offensive linemen. It can happen because of that too. So those are, those are two big things. The good news is that those are addressable, fixable. You can see them on the tape. You can see them on the film. This is a professional team. They can make those adjustments. So it's not like it's world ending. It's not like it's something that is cause for uh, endless concern that you're going to have to deal with for the rest of the season. Now, if they don't get it corrected, then it can be that. But whether you're losing those reps at the worst times, right, at the wrong times, or there's a disconnect in between drop back and protection angles, protection landmarks, things like that, both of those things can be fixed. So that's good news. It's concerning right now, and it's concerning enough that you want to see it get fixed moving forward. That's the way that this all works. When it comes to the run game, you just want to see the New Orleans Saints offensive line win off the line of scrimmage. They're not resetting that offensive line two, three yards upfield or downfield, rather, like you're used to seeing from a good run team. You look at the Philadelphia Eagles, for instance, or even the Indianapolis Colts just a few weeks ago or just two weeks ago, the way that they played the run game against New Orleans, they were just bigger, stronger than the New Orleans Saints defensive line to start that game. They were lifting, pushing, they were getting it so that the running backs were gaining two, three yards before they even cross what became the new line of scrimmage because the defensive line was getting moved back on its heels. And so you want to see the New Orleans Saints offensive line be able to do that to opposing defensive lines. That could also have a lot to do with the way that this team has continued to shuffle its offensive line so far this season. Maybe now that you've got Andrus Pete, James Hurst, Eric McCoy, Cesar Ruiz, and Ryan Ramchick all playing well and all knock on wood playing healthy for the moment or coming out of that game against the Chicago Bears healthy. Maybe you'll start to see a little bit of that improve. Ryan Ramchick's a good run blocker. Eric McCoy, Cesar Ruiz, good run blockers. Uh, Andrus Pete, probably the best part of his game is as a run blocker. At least it was on the interior. We'll see how it is on the outside. But it's one of the reasons why you see the Saints run a lot of the man scheme runs to where it's like, you're in front of me, so my job is to block you, as opposed to the zone runs that we're accustomed to seeing is because they want to be bigger and stronger than the guys in front of them. But when you see something like the fourth and one QB sneak, where the offensive line can't win that half a yard, it's a good illustration of what has plagued the New Orleans Saints run game so far. So far, Taysom Hill's been the most dependable part of the run game, and a lot of it has to do with the specificity of what those runs look like, right? Having the lead blocker come out of the backfield, the pulling guard, the, the you know, Colin Saunders in motion, all those other pieces, which I know that, that ended up being a actually ended up being a a pass, but at another point, they ran him in motion and then he set up to block the edge. He has been, Taysom Hill, their their run game so far, the most dependable part of the run game. And some of that is because you have to be able to create for your halfbacks. You got to be able to create for the running backs. You got to create for Alvin Kamara. You got to create for Jamal Williams. You got to create for Kendra Miller. You have to open up spots for them to be able to use their natural given ability to be able to create more after crossing that line of scrimmage. But when the line of scrimmage is being reset backwards or is at a stalemate at the original snap point, it's hard to win in the run game. And these are things that you still want to see the New Orleans Saints offensive line improve in. So have they improved in narrowing down the pressures and the sacks? 100% absolutely, especially relative to what we saw earlier on in the season. But are there still strides left to be made by the offensive line that would greatly benefit the New Orleans Saints offensive efficiencies? Also, 100%. Yes, we'll see how they're able to do that maybe going into next week against Minnesota. Up next, I'm going to explain to you why I'm not tripping over a seven-point win despite there being five turnovers. We kind of broke it down in the postcast. Let's revisit it. Let me go a little bit more in depth for why I'm not really worried about this and think that this is a talking point that we should all be moving on from and looking at the why and how as opposed to the what. We got that coming up for you as we continue on with today's episode of Locked on Saints, part of Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. 
Today's episode of Locked on Saints is brought to you by our friends at FanDuel, America's number one sports book and the official sports betting partner here on the Locked on Podcast Network. And right now is a fantastic time to get in on the action over at FanDuel. Let's take a look at the New Orleans Saints line against the Minnesota Vikings. Right now, they're favored minus two and a half on the road. So road favorites in this game. Right now, new customers over at FanDuel are going to get $150, 150 in bonus bets, all by winning any $5 money line bets. You could pick something like the New Orleans Saints, which is a closer game. You can pick you know, one that's uh, maybe got a little bit more separation, a larger money line. You can go out there and pick an outright favorite and effectively get 30 to 1 odds. Because if you win that $5 bet, no matter what, you're getting, in addition to your winnings, an additional 150 bucks in bonus Bets. You can then use those for spreads, player props, over unders, and much more. So visit fanduel.com slash locked on today to get started and keep the NFL season going. FanDuel, official partner of the NFL. Let's get it. Who that nation wrap it up today's episode of Locked On Saints. The New Orleans Saints are one of 17 teams since 2003 to have a five turnover differential, a plus five turnover differential, and win by seven points or less. There have been 89 such games, 17 of 89. Not great. Not great. But I'm going to tell you why I'm not tripping. I'm not tripping over this stat. Appreciate you, as always, all you everydayers out there making Locked on Saints your first listen of the day every day. So about 5% of the 89 teams since 2003 have won a five turnover differential game, not always zero turnovers to five, but at least there being a five turnover differential there. Um, three of those teams lost. One of those teams was a tie. Other teams won by seven points or less. It's not a huge group and maybe not a group that you necessarily want to be a part of. But considering the timing of the turnovers, considering the timing of the game, I'm really not tripping over this. So out of the five possessions that the Saints had in the fourth quarter, they were in scoring position on a pair of them, had a field goal earlier on in the second half, and were really in scoring position on the one that they did the turnover on downs to because that was on the Chicago 17. So they were in position each time to be able to walk away, but you missed the field goal. That's on Blake Groupie. That's not on this team. That's on Blake Groupie and, and the team's execution. It's not on the team's execution. That's on the field goal, right? And in the turnover on downs, risky call, risky call. And sometimes you pay for risky calls. Derek Carr was two of two on QB sneaks coming into the game. I'm not sure that Taysom Hill has taken a single snap under center so far this season when he's at quarterback. I get it. I understand. But to sit here and say that none of that means anything, the context, because the Saints only won by seven points and they, they should have won by more with five turnovers. Uh, I'm neither here nor there on it. I'm not tripping on it. I'm really, really not. And here's the other reason why I'm not tripping on it too. I didn't overestimate the Saints coming into this game. Remember, I picked the Saints to win by eight points and I picked them to give up 20 points to the Chicago Bears. They gave up 17. I was close. Not quite there. I was close. Now I did pick the Saints to um, score 28 points as opposed to 24, but they gave up three points less and they scored four points less than I expected them to. I expect them to win by eight, then one by seven. It's why I'm not con- it's why I'm not tripping. It's why I'm not concerned. I think that right now, the gap between the New Orleans Saints and where they are or where they were in this game and the Chicago Bears is not as steep as many people expected that it would be, particularly in the offensive side of the football. I think that where the New Orleans Saints are headed, what they're proving, what they will be after they finish turning this corner, that they're still in the second, which they just finished the second of three games of that corner that they need to turn, will be a lot better than the Chicago Bears. But right now, going into this game, I didn't expect the New Orleans Saints to be two touchdowns better than the Chicago Bears. I just, I just simply didn't. And it's not that I don't believe that this team can be good. I don't believe that this team is getting better. I just think that the team is still actively getting better. Hence why I care a lot more right now about the why and the how as opposed to the what. So we have to look at the context of things like this. So, look, I've been getting a lot of heat, a lot of heat over the last couple of days 
because I haven't been going off the rails about the Saints scoring, winning by only seven points. But that's who the Saints were coming into this game, and it's who they proved to be by the end of the game. That's okay. That's all right. It could have been worse. The Saints could have forced five turnovers and lost this game. But what happened? The defense didn't let that happen. Starting from the starting from five minutes left in the third quarter, the defense completely changed course, completely changed who they were. And they didn't change anything about what they were doing. They just did it better. They just executed it better. They didn't make any adjustments. They didn't start playing differently. They just showed up in a way that they hadn't yet shown up. You look at um, the last drive of the third quarter, okay, in which the Chicago Bears ran off eight minutes and 16 seconds off the clock, ran a 13-play, 82-yard drive on this defense, came up with a field goal, the only score of the second half. Then you look at the rest of it, three plays, two plays, six plays, three plays, two plays. Chicago did nothing, nothing after that moment. So when you have an offense on the opposite side of that, that takes that first possession in the fourth quarter and scores a touchdown with it, the next thing that you do is not lose the game. And that's what the New Orleans Saints offense set out to do. Even though they had an opportunity at a field goal that they missed, got to talk about field goal kicking, got to get it figured out. Blake Groupie's got to be better. No doubt about it. But. The Saints didn't turn around and lose this game. The defense showed up in the fourth quarter and the offense scored the touchdown that they needed to and then put the game away in the fourth quarter without turning the ball over, without giving the ball back to Chicago in a situation and in a bad situation. The starting um, position, the starting field position for Chicago in the entire fourth quarter was on their own nine, their own 25, their own 17, their own two, and their own 37. Never better than their own 40. And in each of those situations, they never crossed the 50-yard line. And in fact, they lost or didn't gain yardage on two of those five possessions. The New Orleans Saints did what they needed to do to win the game. So enjoy your win. Enjoy your win. You deserve it. You absolutely deserve it. I appreciate all you everydayers out there making Locked on Saints your first listen of the day every day. Coming up tomorrow, it's Wednesday, so we're going to get to know the Minnesota Vikings a little bit more. We're going to walk through exactly what happened with them and the Atlanta Falcons, what Joshua Dobbs means to this team, and what's going on with Justin Jefferson. We got all of that in tomorrow's episode. And then, of course, live after practice to get you everything you need to know about the New Orleans Saints practice report and uh, all the takeaways from uh, post availability. So I appreciate you very much for making Locked on Saints a part of your day, part of your routine for saying yes to me and the show. As always, if you see me, please say hi. And if you need anything else around your New Orleans Saints in between these episodes, make sure you follow me on your favorite social media at Ross Jackson, N-O-L-A. Hit me up. Let me know how the family's doing. Let me know how you're living. Let me know how you're mom and them. And trust you, that nation, I'll holla at you.